So with no further ado, I'll, um, well, I suppose, introduce Richard, first of all. Um, I was, well, the number sort of 30 years has sort of come to mind because that's basically how long uh, I've sort of known of or known Richard uh, through Harper and that, uh, and um, talking, delivering sort of training and sort of meeting within the pesticide application world. And uh, Richard has always been sort of Mr. Uh, closed transfer system uh, from, from my way of, of thinking and that. Uh, and our sort of paths of, of crossed and, and recrossed and that over those those times uh, in various sort of you know guises and that. Um, and I'm sure, well, without wish, wishing to steal any of Richard's thunder and that, I will um, hand control over to uh, um, to Richard and uh, let him entertain us, as you might say. <laughs> Well, thank you very much indeed, Simon, not only for your, for your kind words, but also for the invitation to, to join you this evening. Um, and I really appreciate um, all of you for taking the time to, uh, to sit in on the, the Zoom call. Um, very quickly, uh, Simon's introduced me as Richard Garner. I started as uh, an agricultural engineering technician. I trained at Rees Heath, had a couple of spells at Rees Heath. Uh, I then ended up as you may have just heard, working with Dennis Cartmel uh, as a technician at the Rob Baston College. Um, and after experiencing that for uh, a year uh, and getting a little bit of an insight to what other people did in, in that sector of the industry, I decided to go up to the west of Scotland to Ockingrove and did a, an NDIG, or the, the Scottish equivalent of it. Um, a little after that, uh, I moved down to Herefordshire to start teaching for what I thought was going to be a 12 month spell until I got a real job uh, doing something, I don't know, with tractors or some other escapade and enjoyed it so much. I stayed there for nearly 13 years and um, I've seen no reason to move from the area ever since, despite the fact that I stopped working as a, a lecturer in. Uh, 1988, 89, um, and I went self-employed and I'm going to share a little bit of my story with you um, with some slides and a couple of videos from this point. So um, now I'm going to be preaching to the choir on a lot of these points, so forgive me. Um, but the, 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 this is a, a sort of presentation I use with um, a number of groups, some favourable to the industry, favourable. Um, and this is just going to set a little bit of context. This is a well-run farm uh, under some considerable time pressure. Not that unusual, though. This is a sort of waste we're familiar with seeing outside for considerable periods of time. And farmers are responsible for all of this packaging. It comes at a considerable cost, not only cash cost to the, the farmer is part of the cost of the product, but it also has a huge environmental cost too. Greater environmental exposure to concentrates has always been extremely high. Um, we've had the voluntary initiative, we had the Food and Environment Protection Act, and as part of that activity, when I was um, working as a lecturer, it pushed me towards looking at how can we prevent a lot of this from happening in the first place. And uh, a guy I, I met from the health and safety executive at Bootle, who was doing a, a PhD at the time, had pointed out in a paper that 90% or more than 90% of operator exposure occurred as soon as the operator unscrewed the cap from the container and poured the chemical into the sprayer. Um, I naturally felt that there had to be some sort of alternative and it was the uh, naivety of a fool probably that got me to believe that in the first place that the, there could be something easy to, uh, to get around this issue but um, it's what spurred me on. Um, at the moment farmers carry in the UK 100% responsibility for the costs and effects of all this packaging and UK packaging disposal is completely out of step with all of the EU states where manufacturers uh, put together 
packaging schemes that they they get very uh, involved in recovering packaging from farms doesn't happen here in the UK at the moment. Um, agrochemicals, from my opinion, absolutely essential to food production, not just in this country, but in almost every other country. Um, all products have to be dispensed, measured and rinsed, uh, the packaging rinsed. Um, handling the concentrate accounts for 90% of the risk uh, to the operator and environment. And those of you with a very long memory um, will recall studies like the Cherwell Valley study that showed that uh, um, a remarkable amount of active ingredient ended up in the River Cherwell, not from spraying, but simply from loading and point source losses. Uh, it, it's a, a sort of universally acknowledged truth that once products are diluted in the sprayer tank, they can become 200 times less dangerous to both the operator and environment. So coping with the concentrate became my target for this, uh, this area of work. Um, the sort of state of the art when I began this was that farmers would climb up on top of the tank uh, and open the container and pour it in the top of the tank. Quite quickly, uh, with the advent of, of CE marking and uh, CE standards and the machinery directive, there became a universal requirement for new sprayers to have a low level inductor bowl, which in many ways from an operator safety point of view was great, but the only real benefit they had was to stop the operator falling off the top of the sprayer and um, handling the outside of the sprayer where there's an awful lot of um, overspray that's dried and, and formulation. So the normal practice was, was to climb on the tank, open the bottle, pour it into the tank, wash the bottle and dispose of the packaging. Um, um, I guess you're all familiar with this sort of activity. Um, it doesn't matter how well and practiced the operator is, the splashes and spills underneath that hopper are remarkable in the, the volume that adds up over quite a short space of time. Um, then you, you put the container in the hopper and rinse it. it, it that can sometimes be a, a way of putting more contamination on the outside of the pack, as in this case. And this was in an atmosphere where high-tech sprayers costing 20 to now 250,000 pounds or more each um, are used on farms. All of the emphasis of technical development went into GPS positioning, computer control of the spraying process, uh, massive impact in the, the late 90s and early 2000s about drift reduction from nozzles and all sorts of other techniques. Um, heavily heavy involvement of crop protection management plans to try and address the uh, concerns and issues that highlighted by the voluntary initiative. So operator and environmental contamination from concentrate mixing processes were identical and, and until recently still are identical to the practices that we were familiar with in the 1930s. Not me personally, I hasten to add. Um, so pesticide dispensing, measuring and rinsing, absolutely key. And in the, the part of, of my role at Home Lacey to uh, develop uh, training, particularly for uh, training uh, existing farm workers uh, and the whole FIPA pressure to get um, uh, sprayer operators certificated, uh, I came up with some ideas of how we might address uh, th these challenges of operator environmental exposure by enclosing the risk using engineering means. And this was the, the very first uh, transfer system we ever made. It had uh, an induction bowl here. It had a venturi across the bottom, a measuring syringe here, and some control valves. And uh, it, it, it involved taking a cap system that we made, which had the equivalent of um, dry break uh, flat face couplings uh, for use for hydraulics, specially made in size so you couldn't intermix the two. On the top, I had a knife here, 
So you could push that through the, the foil seal on the container, screw the cap down, and then we were we were using suction vacuum from the Venturi to take liquid, the, both the, the concentrate and then the rinsate out through the larger of the two connectors and allowing air in and then rinsing water through the smaller one of the two. That was one of my first big learnings. Emptying a container is totally dependent on getting air in, not taking liquid out. Um, and that's, that, that was a, a very salutary lesson very early on in the process. Um, this is just a picture of showing the, uh, the syringe unit being used to measure part packs. And those challenges and some of those solutions uh, back from the mid to late 80s uh, are fundamental to the process of closed transfer, irrespective of the size of the container. And at the risk of blowing my own trumpet a little bit at the time, um, the year before we got these um, first commercial systems available, I was really pleased to have been awarded the Douglas Bonford Trust Golden Jubilee Award for Innovation to commemorate 50 years of the institution. Uh, and thankfully, we've managed to keep it going uh, for, in the intervening period and uh, now appear to, to be getting close to a commercial solution. This same piece of equipment made many appearances at sprays and sprayers, um, agricultural shows, and came in many guises and formats. Um, I had a, a trailer-based installation I used to take with me around the countryside and probably put the best part of 60,000 miles on that trailer over three or four years, uh, just simply trying to promote this as a, a, a technology which should be adopted by the industry. Um, Inductor ball here was adapted so that it could handle not only liquids through the, the, the Venturian and the bottle adapter I just showed you, but here we could put boxes of powder, uh, bags of powder, and pierce them with this manual spear which injected water into the center of the pack and liquefied the contents into the Venturi as well. Now, all of that was jolly interesting and it seemed to, to do the trick and we sold um, 60 of these units into California, found a, a distributor to take them into California. We, we got them approved by the California Department of Food and Agriculture as a, a closed system. Um, but the chemical industry in Europe wasn't really at all interested in doing anything to make this happen. And um, because of the European uh, packaging waste directive, they got much more interested in finding ways on how to avoid the packaging waste associated with, with pesticide. And we got a lot of inquiries to look at how we could use a container which was refillable and reusable. And the obvious candidate uh, or candidates for that would look at beer containers and uh, and similar uh, systems like like gas canisters and we did quite a lot of work on developing a particularly special valve just for uh, industrial use it had nothing to do with food and we use the same transfer device to generate the suction to both empty containers completely but also allow uh, measurement of smaller volumes we got sealed container and, and, and connections. We got, uh, we, uh, these were possible to empty, uh, but don't rinse. Uh, rinsing was not necessary uh, at that time, and, and for a, a completely returnable system, it's still not necessary now. And the packs could be sent back uh, to the manufacturer for refilling. Uh, this was the beginning of that what is now a much more modern adage, which is to reuse, not dispose. Here we can see it in operation. Again, this is sort of prototype level. It was very simple, easy to use, quick, clean, and started to show significant advantages 
to um, operators uh, in terms of their method of working with the sprayer. Um, because of a, a particular interest from BASF, uh, we began developing in two streams. One directly with BASF for work in uh, banana plantations, which I'll come to in a minute, but by a, a precursor of the, the current BASF company, American Cyanamid, we started a, a project trialing on farms reusable packs of both Stomp SC and uh, an IPU uh, that, that was packed into 25 30 litre containers and delivered to farm with this new valve included in it. That progressed into this project called Ecomatic with BASF and it really took off in Germany particularly on the former East German farms, which were enormous. The first farm we visited and fitted was eight and a half thousand hectares. The largest one we fitted on was two systems and it was 32,000 hectares. These were purpose-made containers. This one was um, a polyurethane jacketed stainless steel container. This was a brand new blow molded polyethylene container made by Mauser for BASF. And they saw this at the time as an international solution. <coughs> um, BASF put all of their top performing products in the system and they, they made a marketing coup out of it by offering farmers um, our equipment to empty those containers free of charge in exchange for a three year soft contract for the purchase of their products. In the first 18 months of law, uh, after the launch, the sales of Stomp, which was the first chemical they put in it, went up by 30%. Uh, by 2014, the number of, contain uh, of uh, products had risen to 25 and represented 80% of BSF sales on the larger East German farms. It wasn't a a completely happy story and we'll, we'll come to that in a minute but uh, even in the UK we had companies like uh, Syngenta, New Farm and others who saw a real opportunity to put uh, some of their products particularly big products like glyphosate into much larger packs and here this is a, a thousand liter IBC with the same valve fitted in this instance through the centre cap um, it quickly showed us that there was a real opportunity to increase the efficiency of the spraying process simply by avoiding opening, emptying, cleaning and disposing of packaging. Um, one of the big challenges that came up from this approach was the logistics, particularly the reverse logistics of empty packs were extremely challenging. And if you recall, through the, the same period from the mid late 80s through to 2010, what had been 14 global manufacturers of uh, 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 agrochemical based on research and development shrank rapidly to three. And in that process, the familiar names and manufacturing sites in the UK and in many other countries just disappeared and shrank to become three massive companies based in Germany and Switzerland. And getting containers back from markets, particularly like the UK to Switzerland and, and Germany became really far too challenging. We'll come back to uh, in a, a few moments about how that's recovered. Um, while that was happening in Europe, the ASF also had a huge stewardship challenge in Central and South America with their banana crop and fungicides. And um, the same technology was applied. So we have the same uh, container valve fitted in the container as a permanent part of the pack. It, it's the pack closure. Um, these packs were 110 litre uh, composite drums. These were filled in country from ISO tanker, shipped from Germany. The containers, these containers replaced steel drums, which were used up to this point. 
And then we use the same detection system here to take the chemical directly out of the pack into this stainless steel tube, which is a 70 litre measuring cylinder, on the outside of which we've got uh, an inch and a half clear tube, which we use to uh, line, up, line up against the, the graduated scale to measure. And the whole concept behind this was that aircraft spray bananas once every 10 days or so, uh, and they, they spray the top of the leaves, not, not the under the canopy or actually on the, the, the fruit, um, are out every single week or two weeks of the year. They never stop. The majority of them are fixed wing, and the time on the ground is absolutely vital. So the system takes out 70 litres from this drum, measured very quickly, and transferred directly into one of these storage tanks where it's diluted, ready for a high-speed transfer when the plane lands. Uh, we could take out 70 litres of chemical, wash the whole system down, and be ready to do another batch tank within three minutes. And the transfer of the liquid, again, it's a baseline for us, any transfer of concentrated pesticide is carried out wherever possible at a negative pressure. So we use a vacuum to move the liquid from the container into the measuring unit and then into the, um, the, the spray, the, the mixing system itself. And we, we get that section by a placing of venturi in the circulation pipe work. The venturi gives us, just like it would on an induction bowl, a, a very nice low pressure. And we can transfer through this system at 25 litres a minute with no difficulty whatsoever. Uh, There's another shot of it. Uh, these are the countries that we've established that sort of equipment in. We've now superseded this measuring vessel with um, a different unit, which we call a fast tram, which I'll show you some pictures of in, in a moment, uh, which is a, a flow meter based solution. And now we can see the, the guy uh, who operates the plant. You can see the straw colored liquid in the measuring tube. We put 60 of those systems into the banana plantations in the 19. And uh, I believe all of them are still operational. Uh, that's just a little summary slide. It shows the, the controls and the uh, details. We're still supplying spare parts of these. Now, it wasn't just in the banana plantation or the UK. Um, Australia um, had a a very interesting approach. Instead of it being a voluntary initiative to, to address closed transfer and packaging waste, the Australian government gave the industry an ultimatum that, that, that the industry had three years to put something in place to address waste containers or else they would. And within that three year period, everything shifted across to using the same container valve, which is you can see in the back of this container here, Exactly the same container uh, valve, uh, it's a very similar return refill process. And now 85% of all is delivered to farm in Australia in returnable closed transfer systems. In the US, it applies to lots of insecticide used in termite control. Uh, they also in the US use lots of IBC totes. And something peculiar to North America are things called acid tanks, which are rotationally molded polyethylene tanks, which are huge. And sometimes they are operated in the same way that I've been describing uh, these other tanks. Sometimes they're equipped with a 12 volt uh, mixing and uh, transfer pump. Um, BASF really promoted this system and made a huge position for themselves, particularly as I say in Germany and in the banana market. But it became uh, acknowledged to be suitable for many products, safe and commercially tested. Uh, they optimized the packaging, that was BSF themselves. Um, they 
sorted out a full delivery and collection service. And because every container was RFID chipped, um, any, any possibility of cross-contamination at the filling site was eliminated. And there was a distinct cost margin bonus for the farmer. Uh, a lot of that is driven not, not from making the chemical cheaper, but because farmers using these containers can fill the sprayer so much more quickly. Uh, we did an exercise recently that you know a, a typical trailer or self-propelled sprayer, you can probably fill with water in 10 minutes. With a closed system uh, working alongside it, you can put the chemical in at exactly the same time. Without a closed system and these sort of containers, most operators would report taking another additional 35 minutes to open, empty and rinse their containers. Now that increase in productivity means that they can get always one extra load out a day and frequently two loads a day. And so far I've not found a big enough tank or a wide enough boom or any other addition to a, a crop sprayer which will give that increase in operational efficiency. Um, through a series of tests through uh, CSR uh, at Sand Hutton uh, and, uh, and other organisations, we've also demonstrated a clear benefit to the environment and the operator by reducing those exposures by a significant degree. Uh, one of the, the tests showed a 3,000 fold reduction in operator exposure. Um, the, the, the system in Germany alone had a platform of 10,000 farms. What killed it very quickly at the end was this uh, reverse logistics for the packaging. I, I thought I'd just throw this slide in from a, a, an engineering interest point of view. The very first uh, closed transfer system we made, we got a significant amount of injection molding materials produced. And we continue to use from that original equipment this tube which in conjunction with a, a set of three replaceable nozzles and an exhaust unit that venturi can can be tuned to any sprayer pump um, irrespective of whether it's a high pressure pump or a lower pressure centrifugal pump these days however most most sprayer manufacturers fit the venture, a venture of some description uh, as a standard item with the induction bar. So um, we have this valve, which is, is made by a company that we're very closely associate, associated in, uh, in Florida called Micromatic, and it provides a secure connection um, and dispense. It's now an industry standard in all countries, not so much in field crop chemicals at the moment, but nearly all seed treatment products are delivered to seed treatment plants with one of these valves included. Returnable packages are ideal for efficient transport and warehouse um, storage. And it gives us a completely closed, sealed and secure vehicle and crop protection products to market. Now, what we've done uh, since those um, systems you, I've shown you pictures of just now, We've condensed our equipment. So instead of having a volumetric measuring device, we've now gone for a flow meter based device. And over many years, we've, we've evolved and developed this meter uh, with others. This one is a positive displacement flow meter with an accuracy of uh, around about 0.5%, but it's completely manual. You, you attach with the cup to the container, then you use this yellow handle valve here for on, off, and gradual stop. Uh, we've tried electronic meters and uh, batch meters. Um, and while they have a, a place, not all batch meters are, are particularly convenient because they, they operate nicely with pesticides because they have no internal moving parts at all. But for them to function, you've got to have a degree of conductance in the liquid. And there are still a small number of pesticides which are heavily oil-based which won't conduct enough electricity to make allow them to work.
those are the, the, the components uh, of what's required to a attach a system into a sprayer. And I'll, I'll show you some examples of that in the notes. So the sprayer can be filled directly in the field. It doesn't require electricity. The, these flow meters operate on a couple of little Duracell um, pen light batteries. Um, the inter integrated flow meter with control valve supports easy metering. Uh, and these di positive displacement meters utilize a, a 20 um, position calibration value to maintain that 0.5% accuracy over a wide range of viscosities. These have been tried and tested on a wide range of sprayers um, in a wide range of countries. It's completely changed the supply chain. So instead of the supply chain previously, and in many cases still now, sadly, linear, manufacturer distribution to user and then opt, it goes into the, the tip. This extra leg of recollection and deposit refund has been tested, it does work, but it requires a change in attitude, just like we have in the banana market, where instead of shipping the containers pre-filled, an ISO tank of liquid is sent to the, the country or region of use, and the, the pesticide containers rotate around this circle, but without going back to the original uh, factory where the, the liquid is made. If that happens, as it does with the banana market, works perfectly. Now, these are some more recent pictures I thought I'd show you. These, these are increasingly common on UK farms. These are IBCs where no tap, no, no drain valve has been fitted at all. The, the tanks are blind. And these come in a range of sizes now from 300 litres, 600 litres, 800 litres and 1,000 litres. And here's a bit more detail of the valve that's inserted into them. These valves are now available in not only stainless steel, but in a plastic nylon composite uh, with, with a glass fibre reinforcing. It has a dip tube fitted. These are installed permanently in the container. And... You, you can see here that, that the, the around the outside of the neck is a stainless steel clinch ring that's been crimped on and at the center is a, a, a disposable plastic uh, temper evident proof cap. On the farm the cap is snapped and taken out as you can see in these three pictures. Um, this, this shows our um, fast tran unit now on top of the container. This shows the coupler close up. This is stainless steel coupler. This is, this is the plastic parts we've got to remove. You can see on the side of the coupler here, there's a little box which covers uh, an air inlet valve to balance the pressure inside the containers we take the liquid out. And on the side of the coupler here, there are three tiny bayonets which engage with the, the slots in the valve. That's, that's what the valve looks like when the evident caps removed and this is based on a beer keg valve but it will not intermix with any of them it's, it's completely unique to uh, to industrial chemicals and then the, the coupler is placed into this opening the slots are lined up with the, the bayonets and then the handle rotated and pressed down when the handles pressed down we get this green seal is depressed and then we get a hydraulic connection as soon as the handle is lifted up, both the valve and the coupler self-seal. So it's, again, very like a hydraulic coupling. Um, you can see there the, the readout on the uh, flow meter. One of our biggest customers for this sort of kit in the last few years has been Monsanto, who sell a lot of glyphosate increasingly through these large containers. And that's a bit more detail of what's on the the dial of the flow meter. So we, we can change the calibration factor here. We can reset the temporary mem me uh, memory on how many liters have just been dispensed here. We can get an accumulated total. We can also turn the flow meter off to allow uh, rinse water to flush through and, and clean the meter. 
And that's what it looks like when it's all assembled ready for use. Now, all of that is great, but these big containers don't really appeal to quite a few farmers, particularly where the, the, the application rate of the product is below one and a half litres a hectare. The, the, the containers are just too big. And this is a, another shot showing it connected to a thousand litre container this, this time. And the connection at the other end to the sprayer is just as important. Here we've got a, a container, a, a hose uh, joined into the suction system on the, the sprayer's venturi and an on-off valve. And here we've got, um, this is available from lots of stores and dealers in the UK. It's a banjo uh, dry break coupling. Again, works just like a hydraulic coupling, but made out of um, side resistant materials. So when the farm has finished using uh, the container and wants to leave the, the, the transfer system in the yard or at the mix site, pull back the yellow collar, disconnect, self seals, and off they go. Um, here's an example of the system in use on uh, three different sprayers, well, two, two different sprayers, but in different containers. These are small containers. We actually made these and got them UN hazardous goods uh, tested simply to prove to agrochemical companies that it was possible. We had these containers rotationally molded um, at a factory in Stockport, which is exactly the same process used by the spray manufacturers to make the tanks, induction bowls, and all the other clean water tanks that are used on the sprayer. Um, but we went to extraordinary lengths to, to prove that it was possible to get uh, a, a suitable container use in this this area. This shows a system fully fitted onto a house and sprayer uh, and it's this one sitting neatly on its rinse socket which is where it's parked when not in use and it has a supply from the clean water tank to be able to flush the system through after use. So um, going back to where we were eventually uh, the industry, and I can't see some of my text on here, I apologise, um, but the industry, the message, and the levels of interest in keeping the concentrate away from the operator and surface water by enclosing the risk with engineering controls eventually began to seep in. Uh, and the objective was simply to deliver more efficiency to the operators with better economy and to keep the public and customers on the side of the industry. And now up until that point, operator exposures remained high uh, because the majority of packaging used in agriculture is by a country mile in the one to 20 litre range. And to put that into context, in Europe, there are about 130 million uh, pesticide containers used each year. And that is um, all disposable containers, all the things you'd see on farms now, 130 million a year. Um, the EU pressure to drastically reduce operator exposure began uh, in around about 2010. I'll give you some more details about that in a minute. The UK response was extremely muted and focused on farmers' behaviour, not on uh, engineering or technical solutions to ensure safety. Much of this was driven through label requirements. Some of you may recall that the Voluntary Initiative and the Crop Protection Association at the same time were promoting knocking holes in 45 gallon drums and using them as plastic incinerators for farmers to dispose of packaging. At that time, there was more contamination to the environment from the smoke generated than there ever was a saving from landfill. So fortunately, those attitudes changed and eventually we got focused on how to prevent these problems, not simply try and clear them up after they've occurred. Catchment studies in the UK and many other countries pointed directly to mixing sites as a major source of surface water contamination. That work continues with the catchment sensitive farming groups who still find lots and lots of pesticide leaching from farm yards. And I know that there's been lots of studies and lots of work done too in diverting uh, those uh, point source losses 
uh, and some that are, are more than point source losses from washing sprayers down or emptying sprayers by the use of uh, bio beds. But essentially, what gets dropped on the floor has to be cleaned up. My objective has always been to stop it dropping on the floor. Um, now, eventually, the ECPA, the European Crop Protection Association, responded uh, to the, the EU pressure to clean up the Industries Act. Uh, and on the uh, 19th of October 2010, uh, the industry uh, recognised that negligible exposure, which is a, a term that the um, health and safety executive gave to the Commission, um, was in the context of this regulation, 11072009 that unless the exposure to humans and the active substances, safeness, stimulus, and all those other things that it covered is negligible, then the product should be used in closed systems um, or any other conditions to exclude contact with humans. And the registrant, this is the first time we ever got any numbers on this, that the registrant must be able to demonstrate a safety factor of at least a thousand times, a thousand fold less contamination than they believed to the place at the time. A lot of this operator exposure study is based on um, a, a predictive operator exposure model, uh, which is used by registration authorities. And that in itself has been a major challenge to get those uh, registration authorities to recognize the contribution that closed transfer can make. Um, and from that point in, in uh, 2010, there has been a considerable uptake in uh, the concept of reduced risk, faster operation, less pressure from regulators to keep the product range uh, available. Uh, Re-registrations have happened on a regular basis and quite a lot of, of active ingredients and really useful products like IPU have been lost from the industry. Much better in environmental profile is something which is on every chemical manufacturer's agenda. And there's much more appetite now for looking at a technical packaging solution. Uh, recognition that current practice is completely incompatible with the technology of the, uh, of the sprayer in the rest of the industry. And that there has to be a reduced involvement with the concentrate. And much less packaging hassle for the operator. In 2010, this got me to thinking what we could do to improve the process. Um, always thinking that prevention is better than cure. The majority of packs, by a long margin, are in that 1 to 20 range. Um, we've got to be able to measure and rinse in the same action. And it's got to be at least as quick as opening, emptying, and rinsing. Um, and it should be adaptable to all farms and packaging. It's got to be, I'm repeating myself, it's got to be faster than the hand pour rinse and the losses to surface drains needs to be better or improved more than 100 times compared to open pouring. Now at this point, forgive me for the slight diversion, but we ended up with a technology crossover as often happens Alongside all of the work I've been doing in closed transfer for pesticide, we got ourselves involved in a whole series of what seemed like completely wacky things probably to you now, but um, we were approached by Shell Chemicals to find ways of dispensing detergent in supermarkets and went through a series of trials in the UK, China, America, trying to pers persuade shoppers to fill and refill their packaging to reduce uh, the amount of packaging associated with them with consumer goods. This also changed the supply chain radically and became extremely disruptive. But surprisingly, it was extremely effective and successful. Shoppers loved it, even in value oriented stores like, uh, like Asda. When we got to the point, a joint development with Unilever and this machine here in 2010, uh, we needed something which would allow the container to directly connect onto the machine to avoid splashes and spills in the aisle. I'm coming back to this in a minute now, but that development led to 
the new packaging system, flexible packs with a unique machine operated closure. We, we went away from PET and, and polyethylene containers to flexibles, halve the amount of plastic in, in the first use. And you'll see here, we've got these caps on that look a little bit like laundry caps already. But at the center of these caps is a hole. In that hole is a plastic plug, which is a bit like a cork in a wine bottle. Um, but it has some interesting characteristics because when the whole pack with the cap on is placed in the machine, the machine recognizes the pack, it checks it's the right pack, it then pushes the fill head through that opening, nails it on the machine so it can't be taken off. There we go. And at that point, as you can probably see, I'll have to just move my screen over here. Um, here's the fill head coming through the cap. The stainless steel pin pushes into the plug and two of the four legs clip onto the stainless steel fill head and then dislodges the other two legs from the inside lip of the cap. Liquid comes out of the hole, fills the pack. When it's finished filling, the fill head withdraws and pulls that white plug back into the cap, completely sealed, no drips, no mess. And it's all made out of one product, polyethylene. Um, now, we'd always had quite a good relationship with the chemical companies, and, and as a personnel change went through, I went over to see a number of them, uh, one in particular, and we got talking about our related activities, and I showed them this sort of um, consumer goods packaging. And the, the question was, what can you do with something like that to allow standard pesticide packaging to fit directly onto a sprayer. Th these were some of the, the criteria that they, they gave me to play with. Um, and we took it away and we used exactly the same technology and we came up with this. This was the first version of Easy Connect. There's a little virtual animation. So there's the cap replaces a normal cap fitted in the factory. We've created a little fill head to attach to it. The large probe takes the liquid out of the pack and the small probe allows air in and then rinse water. Completely automated. You could push that on, take it off. It would open, empty, reseal, and you could rinse it when it was empty. We also created a version like that to go into a drum bung opening um, and that's one of the reasons we had to have two plugs, because once you go beyond 20 litres, you've got to have a dip tube to go to the bottom of the container. Uh, as these things often do, we had a, a, a little bit of a, a, a transition. We, we ran um, field tests on 25 farms in France, the UK and in Germany of that two probe unit, and it worked uh, remarkably well. We could we could empty a container with that faster than pouring it uh, and rinse it without any loss whatsoever. Um, we started to get a lot more visibility from the senior management teams in some very large companies and they judged us to be far too small to partner with them to move it forward. So we got sacked off. Uh, the chemical companies took their half of the technology we developed, uh, their, their half ownership and went and did what they wanted to do. Uh, which was not a happy moment or three years for me. Um, we lost the project um, and it, it went off into a completely different companies' hands who were more involved with, with filling um, very small pouches of baby food. Uh, and they started to, to develop the equipment and the cap and it transitioned because of some changes of strategy inside the chemical companies into only going to be used on one to 20 litre containers and the single um, probe unit was uh, was brought forward. Uh, sorry, I, I think I've skipped some slides from that. I'm just going to show you a picture of that. That's the, that's the single probe closure. Um, the white thing on top is a, a transit cap. 
Inside it is exactly the same plug. This is the advent of the Easy Connect that some of you may have seen at shows and exhibitions or on some test farms in the last couple of years or so. Um, when the cap is fitted, uh, it, it's fitted in the factory. So the farmer takes it out of a cardboard carton and flips the dust cap off, places it over the top of the coupler. And I've taken the, the bottle off to, sh to show this picture. What happens is when this handle here is rotated, the probe comes up, it, it grabs hold of the plug, dislodges it, the chemical comes out down through this slot here. Uh, you can regulate the flow and when the container is empty, you can flush the container and rinse it to the, um, the, re the required level of cleanliness. So this is the early Easy Connect um, single probe. Uh, this be became a, an IPM BASF development. Um, there were further changes in partners and the, our baby food packing company got sold on, changed uh, their operating procedures. And then we introduced um, what was then our partner, Hypro Pentair, into the uh, discussion with BASF. And that's where it sits now. So um, the new prototype was, was produced between um, uh, Hypro and Wisdom. And I'll show you a little video of that in a second. Um, and that was introduced to Agrotechnica. Um, Pentair and Wisdom, my company, are now in a joint development to bring that to market later this year, complete with a measuring system. Uh, and what I'd like to do before I get to any questions, I'll just show you two quick uh, videos. So this is, this is the, the single probe unit in use. This is how the containers will arrive on the farm, already pre-fitted. Off comes the top. Tips upside down on the coupler. Handles rotated. Liquid comes out. And as you can see, it, it is very, very quick. You, you'll get 10 litres of thick chemical out in 12 seconds. Then it rinses. You can see the white cap is still there. When it's empty, that goes down, the, the, the plug's reinserted, and off comes the container. You can, you can also rinse the cap midway, which is what is being demonstrated there. Then the container comes off, it's completely clean, then it can be stabbed onto a draining rack. In, in some countries, they have to drain the containers for quite a long time before they can be used. So that's that's the current state of that particular art. That machine, that, that version of the coupler, which we're involved with, with refining now, has, that, that particular unit has uh, about 160 parts. And it's really expensive to make. Um, what we did partway through the process, we partnered with, um, with Pentair to generate a, a prototype, which was shown at Agrotechnica, which has 22 parts, is much easier to make, and will be uh, a, a new development for our group, um, starting probably uh, in about three months time um, on the development path. So this is very much a prototype. This is ne never gonna be seen on a sprayer, but this this came into 20 parts and uh, is, is fully operational. Vacuum operated again. And this, this is on a little test sprayer that I keep in my uh, facility.
the test liquid that you can see coming out of this is really, really thick goo. And I'm going to mention a little bit about the standard uh, in a moment, particularly the goo. And this is, this is how it washes the cap when it's been closed to ensure that there's no exposure in the middle of, of taking, say, three litres out of a 10 litre pack. In the midst of all that, in 2015, there was a lot of interest from the industry to try and get some degree of standardisation uh, to describe what a CTS is, particularly for that magic 1 to 20 litre band of packaging. Uh, and I injudiciously agreed to attend a, an ISO standards meeting in Poland, um, gave a presentation, and before we left the room, I had been asked to convene a working group to put the standard together, which was, um, was a very nice thing to happen, but was also quite daunting. Um, and from that time in 2015, we, we put together a working group, Working Group 24, formed with uh, about 78 colleagues across many countries and from many and diverse uh, backgrounds. Um, but we, we were totally focused throughout that five years on putting together a performance based standard, nothing to do with, with a, a design or any particular manufacturer or make or concept. It was purely a standard to define how to control and reduce the risk of operator and environmental exposure when emptying containers in that range. Uh, and it sounds remarkably simple said that quickly. Uh, it was far from simple and the, the the amount of meetings, calls, testing that went into that opened my eyes about standards work more than I could ever imagine possible. And had it not been for the fantastic input, not only of the, the, uh, the experts from all around the country, but also one of your members who's on the call tonight, uh, Keith Hawking, um, it would not have happened or come to pass. It was... Um, one of the most challenging things I've ever done to balance the egos, ambitions, and um, in, in some instances, stark naked and stark naked uh, ambition for commercial interests. Um, it was hugely, hugely challenging. Um, but given all of that, eventually in, in uh, uh, February this year, we got the standard completed. Uh, it may not be as 100% perfect as I'd like to say it, but it's certainly good enough to, to, to be usable. Uh, and that was is now available um, or will soon be available through um, BSI as a fully published document. Questions come up on the, uh, on the chat. Uh, let me get back to that. Uh, so if I can start with your question, Alan Plum, um, are there other industries you are trying to break into? Yeah, well, very definitely. Uh, and the, 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 the detergent home, well, it's, the, the whole category is home laundry and personal care is an area in retail goods, which I am desperate to get into. And we, we've recently partnered with a, a Japanese company called Fuji Steel or a global manufacturer of packaging and, and and filling machinery. Uh, and that's how we're doing that. We've resurrected all of our relationships with, with Asda, Unilever, and all of the other people. And um, yeah, it, it, it's become uh, hugely uh, engaging. And right now, a, a great opportunity for us to, to expand into. One of the first questions we've been asked by a number of retailers brings me straight back, however, to agriculture because one of the products they really want to put in a refill system is milk. By using one of our systems, we can, we can take massive amounts of plastic away from milk and we can uh, supply milk in 1000 litre palacons, which is a big bag in a box or, or an IBC and deliver chilled milk from a warehouse, a chilled ware warehouse into an aisle and deliver three or four different container sizes per, per fat content of milk or variety of milk. And it saves all of the open fronted chillers that we see in supermarkets today. 
so the, the, the economic benefits from that are huge. Um, I also work, as I mentioned very uh, earlier on, uh, with a company called Micromatic, and we're introducing the same valves and closed system technology into the general chemical industry for things like um, metal finishing, chrome plating, lots of other uh, metal cleaning processes where the chemicals used are pretty unpleasant and have recently been put onto the REACH register for um, uh, chemicals of serious and very high concern because of operator exposure. So yes, I, I, I am open to any and anything that involves chemical dispensing. Oh, another question from you, Alan. Uh, she's taking me back to my early days at HSE and agricultural <laughs> expert. Yeah. Um, I thought I recognised your name. We've met before, haven't we? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yes, I spent um, a number of rather uh, delicate and somewhat uh, excruciating meetings in Paris with, with some of your colleagues trying to wrestle standards through, not just for chemical handling, but you know, the height of booms folding under electrical wires and all sorts of other crazy things. Yeah. Don't, don't, don't get Keith started on that, Richard. That's still going oh, on. It, it, it's probably Keith's favourite topic. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, interesting times with uh, John Summerscales, the um, deputy chief, and uh, and David Left, who you, you didn't mention by name, but who did the research. Yeah, I it, worked it, it was David Left, and I... You're absolutely right. And I, I owe David, another person I owe a debt of gratitude to, because it was David's doctoral work that that pointed out the blindingly obvious to me and, and inspired me to, to sink a very significant amount of my family's housekeeping into being a bit, a bit of a, an idiot for a while. I, but, um, I, I shall send him a message and mention him. Yeah, well, definitely. I actually called through to the HSE the other day, well, through the CSR route anyway. Uh, uh, sorry, CRD route, and um, I asked, inquired about David Left. No, nobody had heard of him. So, I, I, if you've got his contact details, or by all means, give him mine. That'd be even better. I'll, I'll, I'll definitely do that. Yeah, I, I'm in contact with with them all. I'm secretary of the Retired Inspectors Association as well. So, oh yeah. right. Well, as you, as you probably guessed, all of you now. Um, over the last 30 years, closed transfer systems have had the gestation period of several generations of elephants. And uh, even now, we're still only touching on the edge of some potential commercial adoption. But hopefully this year should see, see that get manifested with most of the sprayer OEMs. Um, I think those were the, the questions that were on there. Um, there's, there's well, how would you like to proceed from, from there, Simon? Whiting. Sorry? There's one from Mike Whiting there, Richard, which is, um, you haven't mentioned the infamous term patents. Uh, are such files registered? Yeah, I, I'll, yeah you, you really want to take me into painful territory, don't you? Um, when I started out, I wrote the first patent for that very first machine we, we made. Uh, I, I read an awful lot of other people's patents. I went and visited a patent attorney, but couldn't afford to employ him at the time. And I wrote a patent and got it registered in lots of different countries. And then I found out just how expensive it is to own a patent. Uh, that was one lesson. The second lesson was uh, to keep owning a patent and keep it current costs even more. And the third, salutary lesson was that if you ever wanted to use a patent and try and get any value from it, you've got to have sufficiently deep pockets to take some of the world's largest companies into court. And that just isn't going to happen. So I, I spent more money than I'd ever spent on buying two houses, never mind one house, on patents, another big lump of a similar size on molding tools. And uh, yeah, we made some progress, we got some visibility, but patents have now become, for me, an area where I am more than happy to submit patent applications, but my method of, of uh, using them now consists of ensuring that I've registered my IP and my know-how so that nobody else can stop me doing it. And then, Quite frankly, I let them lapse because it's, it's, unless it's something which is utterly unique, it's almost impossible 
to get money back from, from doing anything to do with patents. I'm sorry I missed your question, Mike. Does that, does that answer your question? Sorry, you're on mute, Mike. Yes, no, certainly does. Yeah, no, that's um, an interesting, uh, interesting comment. Thank you. <laughs> well, I, I, I've, I've met other people who've got patents, and all I can say is they must have had a bigger sugar daddy than I'd ever had, because I, 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 I've gone through two patent lives already, two 15-year periods, and we would have made not a penny from it. Yes, um, people sometimes think that they're the um, holy grail, um, but obviously um, there's a lot more uh, behind the scenes. Uh, always, and um, with patents, it's a little bit like the old um, story about uh, the general who, who makes lots and lots of plans about engaging with the enemy, but no plan ever engage, it ne never survives the first engagement with the enemy. And once you've, once you've got your patent and you've made your first prototype, not until you've got it into the hands of some farmers, who then tell you what they like about it and what they don't like about it, and you could easily start rewriting the patent thing all over again. Yeah, okay. well, there's, there's, there's some very big tractor manufacturers that have got some patents, and even those have got a shelf life on them. So, um... yeah, well, I've never come across a farmer, or particularly in this company, an ag engineer who's not got sufficient ingenuity to, to work their way around most patents. Thanks very much, Richard. <laughs> if there are any more questions, that's, that would be good. But if not, I'm, um, I'll hand it back over to you, Simon. Uh, well, Bill's just come in with a question. Uh, oh, sorry. Bill Basford. What are spray manufacturers' reactions nowadays to fitting your systems? Do induction bowls have a limited lifetime? Um, interestingly, when we showed that piece of equipment at Agritechnica, um, I've lost track now, but it's about four years ago, uh, we, we incorporated it in a half an inductor bowl so that you could imagine that the whole induction system fitted under, under one lid and raised and lowered with the induction bowl. And that, that got quite a lot of um, people's imaginations running. And that's still a conversation we're having uh, with sprayer OEMs. They realize that a closed transfer is coming. They are very, very engaged with, um, with us and with, um, with companies like Pentair. Um, and they know it's got to happen because those caps will appear on farms this year. Um, countries like the Netherlands and Denmark are giving farmers tax incentives to go to closed transfer. Um, and there will be other incentives like the withdrawal of some products if they're not in closed transfer systems, France in particular with fungicides. Um, so spray manufacturers get it. Uh, they will not take uh, a lot of direct action instead of just preparation. They won't take any direct action until they see those containers arrive on the farm with those caps. Because without that happening, we're in, a, we're in one of those chicken and egg circles. No caps on farm, no need to, to, to sell and fit. Um, but the commitment from the agri agrochemical companies um, was made very clear in October 2018 when BASF Syngenta, New Farm, Certis, and a whole host of others like Adama provided a joint press release saying that as companies they were independently adopting the Easy Connect cap as their closed transfer system. And it left Bayer outside the, the party. Uh, that was Bayer's choice. But I firmly believe that um, when those caps start to appear on farms, I think the vast majority of liquid chemical will appear with those caps on because the caps are going to be made available to everybody. Yeah, okay, thank you very much. I have a little bit of a vested interest. Many, many years ago, I used to load ag aircraft in the fens and I used uh -huh. to have to rip off 17 metacystox tax caps with pipe grips and get 70 gallons ready every 17 minutes. And that took some doing. 
and, yeah. and I, yeah. know, I know I left an awful mess in some of the fens of the ditches there. Yeah, so. it's um, it, it was it, it's kind of you to share that experience, Bill. But hopefully, those sort of things are going to become a thing of the past. Quite rightly, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um. Good. So, um, if there aren't any more questions now, Simon, I'll hand back to you. If if, if anybody has got uh, any further questions or follow up, um, perhaps Simon, you'd be good enough to circulate my signature block or contact details, would you? Yes, yes, I can. I'd be very pleased to hear from any of you at any time. 